and we've got a solid 40 frames per second. I, I don't think this is how it's supposed to look. <sighs> This is one of the first Mac minis Apple ever made, and it's actually the first year that Apple started using Intel-based processors rather than their own PowerPC processors. Because this processor is over 15 years old, we're probably not gonna get great performance out of it, and I don't think it's gonna be a great desktop experience. The efficiency probably won't be great either, so I don't really think it's gonna be a good computer to run something like Home Assistant 24-7 on. But what I do think it could do pretty well is play some really old retro games. Because it's pretty compact and actually looks okay, I think it could be pretty cool to just pop in your living room. That is if we can get a retro game emulator installed and running. In this video, we're going to check out how this performs running Mac OS, but also install Linux to see if we can get a better desktop experience. We'll also try to install some sort of retro game emulation so that we can play most likely NES titles, but we might run into some complications. Before we get into that though, I want to take a moment to talk about the sponsor of today's video, Atlas VPN. Whether you already use a VPN or have no idea what a VPN even is, you should definitely take a look at Atlas VPN. Atlas VPN has the best deal on the market, and right now, if you click the link in the description below, you can get three years plus three months for free for only $1.83 a month. Having a VPN service is incredibly helpful because it can allow you to access content outside your region, and it also encrypts your data between you and the VPN servers, protecting you from things like man-in-the-middle attacks. I started using Atlas VPN a few months ago when I was needing to download some content, but was restricted because of my IP address. I installed Atlas VPN in seriously like one minute, and was then able to access the content that I needed. I love how affordable Atlas VPN is, and that I can use it on as many devices as I want and I can do that without any noticeable loss in speed, even on my home's gigabit connection. Atlas VPN has lots of other great features too, like built-in data breach monitoring and tracker blocking, as well as servers that are optimized for streaming. I'm a nerd, so I also like the ability to switch between the IPsec or WireGuard protocols. Once again, you can get Atlas VPN for three years plus three months free for only $1.83 a month, so head down to the link in the description below so you don't miss out on these savings. This Mac Mini was released in late 2006, and as I mentioned earlier, was one of the first models to feature Intel processors rather than Apple's own PowerPC chips. It features the Intel Core Duo T2400, a dual-core CPU clocked at 1.83 GHz. Normally, this SKU would come with 512GB of DDR2 memory, but it would seem that someone else has already tinkered with this machine a bit because it currently has 2GB of RAM installed. This model also has an 80GB, 2.5-inch hard drive, and an optical drive. On the back, there are 3.5-inch headphone and microphone jacks, four USB 2.0 ports, a display port powered by the onboard Intel GMA950 graphics, a Firewire 400 port, Gigabit Ethernet, and the DC jack for power. Apple, being Apple, used a proprietary connection here, but fortunately the DC power adapter was included when I bought this. I picked all of this up for $15 on Facebook Marketplace, which is admittedly a bit much for the specs, but that's the Apple tax, I guess. One interesting fact about this machine is that the CPU is actually socketed, so we could potentially upgrade this to a Core 2 Duo and get a bit more performance out of it, but that'll have to wait for a future video. Before getting booted into Mac OS or anything, I wanted to see what the internals of this thing look like, partly because I figure some fresh thermal paste wouldn't hurt, but also just because I'm curious. I'm not sure how, but I missed filming the initial part of opening this case up, which involved me using a butter knife, so sorry you don't get to see that. Fortunately, I was able to just follow an iFixit guide for the rest of the disassembly, which mostly involved a lot of little screws, ribbon cables, and frustration. After a few minutes, I gently separated this top section of the internals, which holds the fan assembly, hard drive, and optical drive. In the bottom, we have the two DDR2 SODIMM slots, as well as the CPU heatsink, which is very awkwardly secured by these little plastic pins, one of which shot all the way across my kitchen. Eventually, I got the heatsink off to expose the socketed Core Duo T2400. I didn't bother cleaning up this Mac Mini that much because it seems like it might have been cleaned up when someone replaced the RAM, and it really wasn't that bad. 
So I just replaced the very hard and dry thermal paste and started reassembling. With fresh thermal paste applied and everything back together, let's fire this bad boy up into its native operating system, macOS 10.5. I don't really know why, but I was surprised that the initial experience was relatively smooth and almost snappy, even with the 2.5 inch mechanical drive. This makes sense I guess, because these machines worked decently well back in the late 2000s, but that was roughly 15 years ago, and after opening Safari, well, we can see how old this operating system really is. I tried to see what browsers were available for Mac OS 10.5 and was able to get an older version of Firefox installed, but that proved to be worse than Safari. I bet I could get something working, but I'd rather just get on with installing Linux on this Mac mini. So I swapped out the hard drive for a 128 gig SSD, popped in my Ventoy USB drive, which has a few different ISOs on it currently, including Debian Linux, booted it back up, and then... Oh, wait. So, two things happened here. First, I forgot that the Core Duo is a 32-bit CPU, and my Debian ISO is 64-bit, but that's an easy fix. The bigger issue is that this Mac Mini is, well, a Mac. The boot manager doesn't allow me to boot using Ventoy or any other Linux installer. Now quickly, I should mention that I'm not an expert when it comes to boot managers, loaders, UEFI, and things like that, but I'm sure you guys are and will let me know everything I did wrong in the comments. Fortunately, there is a thing called ReFind, which is a boot manager that should allow us to boot from whatever compatible OS we want. I couldn't download the zip file using my outdated browsers, so I downloaded it from another PC and copied it over using a flash drive. After running this script and rebooting, we're met with the Refined Boot Manager screen. And here, I was able to boot into Ventoy, select my 32-bit Debian 10 ISO, and, well, nothing. It would just hang here indefinitely. I'm not sure why, but Ventoy didn't seem to work with this setup. Fortunately, I was able to simply flash a USB drive with the Debian installer and boot from that, and it worked. After filling out all of the necessary information and selecting the XFCE desktop environment, we had Debian Linux installed on our Mac Mini. I didn't have any issues with drivers, at least with what I tested, which was nice. The performance wasn't amazing, but I mean, we're using a Core Duo mobile chip from 2006, and everything was actually decently snappy. I was able to use a modern web browser to peruse the web, and was even able to render Apple's own website finally. YouTube videos aren't really going to be a reality though, unless you want to watch your content in 480p, but I wasn't expecting even that really, considering the lack of decode support on the Intel GMA950. As fun as general computing can be, I really wanted to start playing some games on this Mac Mini. Now obviously we're not going to do anything crazy using the specs here, but I think it should be able to handle something like NES emulation pretty well. I had planned on using an OS like Batacera, Laka, or RetroPie, but once again, I ran into an issue I couldn't quite solve. I could never get the Mac Mini to boot any of these. I tried installing 32-bit versions of Batacera and Laka, but both of them failed to boot. This probably comes down to shortcomings in my own knowledge, and if you think you know how you could fix this issue, let me know in the comments. I'm sure you'll all be very patient and understanding. I wasn't going to let this issue stop me from playing some Super Mario Brothers on this Mac Mini though, and since we already have Debian working, I decided to see if I could get emulation working within that. I started out by installing ZSNES, or ZSNES, which is supposedly pretty well optimized and lightweight, but I wasn't able to get it to work for some reason. So I moved on to another emulator called Hygen, which is less optimized in favor of running the games in the most true to hardware fashion. This made me a bit nervous, and my fears were realized when I got Super Mario Bros. running, but at about half speed. I hadn't given up hope yet, and while trying to get these emulators working, I actually came across install instructions for RetroPie on Ubuntu, which I didn't really think was a thing. 
but I decided to give it a shot, even though I was worried that there might be a fair bit of overhead. Basically, I just had to run a script that handled all the install, and after waiting nearly an hour for it to finish, I copied my NES ROM into the correct folder, ran emulation station in the command line, and started it up. After my experience with Hygen, I was a little doubtful that we would get a playable experience, but it was essentially perfect. No hitches, no slowdown, just a solid 60 frames per second. To get the full experience, I swapped out my dumb old Nintendo Switch in my living room for our newly formed game console, and even got my Xbox 360 controller working using a wireless USB adapter I have. I ended up playing for quite some time, and the only real issues that I ran into was that I couldn't get audio to my TV due to only having a DVI output, so it just came through the Mac Mini's onboard speaker. I was also able to set up Debian to auto log into my user account and then have RetroPie start on login, so this could essentially work as a little console. I'm not saying it isn't janky as all get out, but it does work, and I accomplished what I set out to do with this little Mac Mini, and I'm content with that. Now, I want to be clear. I'm definitely not recommending that you should go out and buy one of these. It's not very powerful, really difficult to upgrade or work on, and you're probably going to pay sort of an Apple tax just because it's a Mac. But if you happen to have one of these already lying around, it could be cool to try it out as a retro game emulator, or just take it to a recycling center. I wouldn't necessarily blame you. If you liked this video and you want to see more content like it, make sure to hit the subscribe button and check out some more of my videos where I tinker with old PCs and try to find fun ways to use them. That's all for this one though, so as always, thanks for watching, stay curious, and I'll see you in the next one. That's about it for this one though, so as always, don't forget to... That's about it.